so thanks everybody for for joining or listening now or listening in the future the purpose of this uh, fellowship uh, webinar is to be part of a, a bigger program of disseminating what the new fellowship path is what the arguably what the new fellowship is um, and to demystify it slightly to encourage people to talk about it uh, and hopefully that will then uh, encourage people to consider applying to talk about what it takes to apply uh, and what uh, what that looks like how do you what motivates that interest um, and uh, we'll share some some tips of recent applications Myra will very kindly share her whole experience of, of from start to finish of, of how she got through the process and also what Fellowship Day is evolving into, which is quite exciting. Um, if we go at the very beginning, we can't see you, you can't see us, but that's who we are. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for the, the kind introduction. But we're going to go right back to the beginning. Um, and this was this is kind of fascinating. The Fellowship from the RCVS uh, the the concept was launched back in 1876 uh, when I suspect the profession was largely male and largely knew each other and the intent then was to uh, encourage a collective group of individuals to uh, push the profession forward to encourage research to, to engagement with the uh, other members of the profession but also members of the public and at the time, way back in 1876, they were envisioning round about 5% of practicing veterinary surgeons would be fellows from the outset. Uh, I can't tell you how many vets that was in 1876. It may not be that many, but around about 5% was their target. Over time, that uh, began to change. Originally, uh, at the very outset, you had to be qualified uh, had to be at least 26. Uh, soon after that became you had to be at least 22 to be a fellow in, in, that, in that century. But certainly in, in recent history, um, it has become much more of a thesis-based uh, application process. Uh, you had to be at least five years qualified. You had to have a three-year, uh, some form of postgraduate research study, either as a form of PhD or some form of research within practice um, or there was a second route which was going to be uh, a meritorious contribution to learning and that was awarded by your peers in contribution so in recognition of your contribution to normally academia uh, very often it was given towards the end of a uh, of an academic career uh, applicants or, or I guess uh, fellows had been qualified for at least 15 years with a large expertise in a particular area. But those were the two paths, either a very heavy research-based approach resulting in some form of examination, or, or, or rather thesis rather, or the specific nomination by your peers, often at the end of your career. In 2013, there was very much a review on how were we doing as a profession, where was the fellowship in all of that? Uh, and was this actually what the college wanted? Was this the, 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 the body of people they were looking for? In 2013, as you can see, there were a total of 236 fellows on the register uh, out of uh, almost 23,000. So roughly 1% of veterinary surgeons were fellows. And we were only appointing two or three a year, mostly through meritorious contribution to learning. There were some theses being, theses being awarded, but often they had been by nomination. And of course, that was going to result in a very, very slow increase in the number of fellows. And, on, and the, the complication, of course, of having uh, fellows towards the end of their career meant that in terms of getting re-engaging back with the younger fellows, uh, the younger researchers, the younger practitioners, uh, 
and of course students, that gap between the potential applicants and the existing fellows was, was only ever staying the same or possibly even widening. And of course the Royal College wanted a fellowship that was a bit more dynamic, a bit more uh, involved with uh, current life to be honest. As we know the vet profession is diverging rapidly, not only through career paths uh, that didn't exist 20 years ago or 50 years ago, also through uh, demographics, uh, changing through uh, the number of vet schools, uh, changing through part-time and full-time. And so what the Royal College wanted was a fellowship that actively reflected that rather than the existing system. And conceptually, they wanted a much more active program to, yes, to recognise what you've done in the past, but also to then try and bring those people back to give some sort of contribution to the college and the profession as an ongoing basis uh, for possibly the second half of their career. And so feedback uh, in the evolution and growth of the fellowship. The hope was that it would be much more active than previously. And the, the previous fellowship is full of absolutely remarkable individuals, uh, remarkable uh, and fantastic achievements. Um, but, but many or several are, are close to retirement and they have understandably a, a different perspective on, on what time they have, spare time. Uh, and so the hope was to, to bring a younger set of, of fellows together to have a much more dynamic setup and also to try and create what is ultimately a fellowship. So a collective identity of people who share common interests, share common goals, understand that this is part of a, a, a collaboration rather than simply an award. Uh, and, and that's really been the, the beginning of this process. And we've tried to carry that through the whole time. A key part, as you'll realize, of the fellowship application is actually, well, what will you bring to the fellowship? What will your contribution be going forward? This is not meant to be something, a simple recognition of things you may or may not have achieved in the past, but you're signing up for a bit more uh, of a collaborative effort going forward. And ultimately, the plan is to have a, a learned society where we bring... Uh, a variety of clinicians together uh, from large animal practice, small animal practice, industry, academia, charity work, armed forces, uh, any aspect of the profession as we know is, is a broad and rich tapestry, bring those together um, to help uh, with understanding of, of scientific problems for the college, scientific issues for the profession, and also ultimately, uh, hopefully disseminate information for the public at large. And that's always been the goal. Uh, and that hopefully runs through all of the application process. And it is the basis of an active learning society rather than a, um, towards the end of, a, uh, towards the end of a, a career award. So what happened, as we've discussed, was in May 2014, we had this process where there were two routes to the fellowship. One was a fellowship by thesis that we've discussed, and that most of those were done in practice, uh, very often at least three years, almost full time, uh, which was difficult for most practitioners, to be honest. Uh, there are outstanding examples of that, but it's, it's a significant burden on the family, significant burden on the practice. You need a very understanding um, uh, colleagues to, to make that work. Uh, or the MCL route, which was largely academic. I think that was fair to say that. So what we, the RCVS looked to do, and this was before Myra and I were involved, uh, this is some gra fantastic groundbreaking work done by Gary England's group, was to identify three new routes to the fellowship. Uh, as you can see, uh, contribution to the profession, to knowledge, or to clinical practice. And I, I think that the key word there is contribution. So this is not that you're great at taking exams. This is not that you've won a whole bunch of 
awards because contribution has is a variety of uh, of, of meanings to a variety of different um, uh, careers, and so we are looking for sustained contribution in some capacity to the route that you've taken. The uh, the uh, conversation about going to three routes went to our CVS Council. Uh, they were happy with the concept of the vibrant uh, learner society. They were happy with the concept of uh, making this more available across the whole profession uh, with an emphasis on a, a target for practitioners uh, to aim for um, and that's a key part of this uh, and also therefore went to include this the governance uh, setup of both the fellowship board to help oversee the transition from the working group to the reality and then a credentials panel who were uh, all of our peers uh, to review the applications uh, and decide uh, at what point uh, were they achieving the expected uh, contributions. Uh, 2016, so really not long ago, uh, that was the application window for year one. So only you know, 16, 17 months ago, the applications were put in. It was quite a short window, uh, to be fair. Um, too short in hindsight and you know we're very aware it's a very short window the applications came in for the first year they were uh, reviewed and discussed uh, roughly round about late summer early autumn uh, and then we had the fellowship day in 2016 in October we were learning constantly from this process because of course it was starting pretty much from scratch and so several things have changed uh, for the following year, and we'll discuss some of those. One of the biggest things currently is there is now no application window. And so you can apply at any time of the year when you feel your packet um, is ready, uh, when your uh, mentor thinks you're in a good place. And uh, there will be a cutoff every year for review for that year, but there is now no window to encourage uh, a simple a process as possible. The application window for this year uh, for review closed in February. Uh, those packets have been reviewed uh, in the spring, early summer. The board met in the summer uh, and we can share the outcome of that with you uh, in this webinar. Uh, and those, six, those fellows who were successful this time around, uh, I stress that because you can apply an unlimited number of times uh, who are successful this time around will be awarded their fellowship uh, in October of this year and Myra will share with you what that's going to look like. So the, the, the cornerstone really of, of the, the approval that the, the Royal College made was to increase the number of routes for fellowship, uh, not to push it down an academic route entirely Although, of course, there are pathways for um, uh, academic uh, scientists, there are pathways for academic clinicians, there are pathways for specialists, and there are pathways for people who don't have, who are not a specialist, people who are not, uh, uh, not in an academic setting. Um, and the early conversation, if you remember back at the beginning, was to have a target of 5% of the profession. Well, the working party decided and the board, the fellowship board, uh, continue with that decision that there is no limit to numbers uh, because that will create pressures in one direction or another. But actually we will be judging uh, all applicants on merit and therefore the number will almost certainly increase over time every year, whether it plateaus at a certain point uh, naturally that may happen but conversely we're not restricting this to an absolute number because that's actually not the point the point is that if we think the contribution has been uh, appropriate and uh, has been uh, for a long time and you are keen to continue that level of contribution then that's exactly who we want in the fellowship continuing all the good work uh, and the bottom point 
it, the goal is, like I said, it's not about passing exams or doing residencies. There are paths for those, of course there are, but hopefully uh, there are many opportunities for people that have never sat an exam since they left vet school. And that's quite important to realize. The board as it currently stands, uh, and this is ultimately where every application ends up, uh, is there is a chair, uh, and I currently have that position. There's a vice chair from the Royal College, and, and that uh, is, has been in the past, uh, the past our CBS president. Uh, then there's a vice chair from within the fellowship, uh, who at the moment is Jane Dobson. And then we have three credential panel chairs who will come to shortly. And then a lay observer uh, who is a non veterinary surgeon uh, who is there to oversee every single board meeting, every single decision uh, about whether someone is successful or not. Uh, do they think what, we are, what is going on is fair, is reasonable, is transparent? Uh, and ultimately, they have the final say uh, if they feel what is going on is not in any way. Um, in the remit of the board and we have a very good working relationship with them of course but they are naturally independent the credential panels uh that, that all the applications go to roughly 30 people it's not exactly 30 but roughly 30 divided into three broad channels and each channel one for knowledge one for clinical practice and one for uh, the profession uh, there are broadly 10 in each, but not quite, uh, because the applications in each path is not exa quite exactly the same. It's not totally shared equally. Uh, but they have, are all volunteers. Uh, they all applied for to be a credential panel member. They were reviewed by the original working party uh, to, uh, before they were appointed. Uh, they are on that for at least uh, three years, and they will then rotate often will get new applicants. Uh, they are not all fellows. In fact, the vast majority, or many of them, sorry, are, are, are members of the Royal College. And they are there to um, process the applications. Each application will be reviewed by several members of each panel. And uh, they've all had training. We have on-site training every uh, year, uh, normally around about January, February time, where everyone, uh, uh, meets uh, in London to go through uh, past applications and look at how they were graded and go through a variety of different paths to understand the level and complexity of each application. So for example if you volunteered to be on the clinical practice panel yes during the day you'll be looking at a whole bunch of past applications and how they were graded but you'll also be looking at papers from knowledge and applicants from the profession to understand uh, the, the, uh, the process of keeping this as, as fair across all paths as possible. Because there are, there are times when an applicant to one path we may feel is much stronger in a different path. And if that happens, we'll do our absolute very best to move it into the correct path to, uh, to ensure success. So there are several that move between different paths and, and, and we'll show you those uh, figures later. Uh, and the goal is to make sure, uh, as we are all learning about the new system, that people end up in the right position and are being reviewed by the right people. So if you go through two paths, you'll be reviewed by at least three or four people in one path. And you may then be reviewed by three or four people in a different path. And ultimately, everyone ends up at a board meeting, the credential chairs, uh, bring all the, the papers, all the applications, all the gradings from all the, by this point, hundreds of reviews are brought to a board meeting and every single one is then reviewed again uh, to make sure that there are, is consistency between each uh, uh, arm and across all three arms. Uh, these are the three chairs of the panels. Uh, knowledge is being overseen by uh, Professor Tim Skerry, uh, clinical practice by Fred McKeating and contribution to the profession by Richard Drummond. So they will look at every single application to their uh, arm 
and uh, if they feel or if their reviewers feel that maybe it should be reviewed by a different arm they'll also talk amongst themselves and move people from one to another uh, to, to have it re-reviewed if that happens if you submit an application to for example clinical practice and you get a, a, an email back or a letter back from Royal College saying actually do you mind if we review it in the profession or do you mind if we review it in the knowledge that is entirely to your benefit uh, and the purpose being there's a few key things that you've done that, that are outstanding in certain areas that we feel uh, could be rewarded in a slightly different way you'll be given some time to if you like bring in additional supporting uh, information perhaps you might want to expand a few things uh, for a different path perhaps you might even want to ask someone for a different reference but these are like I said this is an attempt to improve your uh, your application in any way possible uh, so most people will say okay that's great let's go that path if you want to keep to exactly the same path you're on that is also fine and you have a complete right to say no I want to keep it in clinical, in clinical practice but most people understand that we're trying to do them uh, to improve their application not uh, make it more difficult or decrease the chance of success these the next few slides is information that's taken from uh, the the application processes from the uh, PDFs that you can see on the RCVS website, uh, from the notes pages, uh, and they are designed really to start um, sharing with you on this webinar the sorts of things that you might be looking for, the sort of path you might be leaning towards, uh, because we, we know it's a you know it's potentially a slightly overwhelming situation. Uh, this is exactly why we're doing things like this to try and break down some of those barriers um, and to improve your chance of success to be honest the, uh, the the information the application itself uh, will be reviewed by the fellowship panel on the criteria below you can see in black we are looking this is not something that you have to be outstanding in all of those bullet points because that arguably is not realistic we are looking for an outstanding contribution in at least one or more uh, that we think is sufficient to warrant uh, a fellowship um, we will look at all of those contributions uh, in the, the standard of, of successful uh, candidates recently uh, to try and make sure the benchmark that the level is as consistent as possible so if you look at those, we start, uh, for example, with the first one, uh, some form of innovative discovery or application of knowledge or developments to the veterinary profession in a groundbreaking way. Things we have considered in the past include uh, some form of IT uh, development. We've looked at teaching innovation. We've looked at uh, development or discovery of a physical tool that is useful uh, in the profession. Sustained contribution to scholarship uh, is very often uh, research-based, uh, very often through publications, dissemination of knowledge. Uh, of course, this could also be linked to teaching. Uh, the third is a, a body of creative work. Uh, very often, again, this, this could be peer-reviewed research, but absolutely not exclusively that. And if you look at the examples we give for teaching material, for textbooks, for promotional material, even for working in a political sphere, whether that's politics, uh, for example, uh, within the Royal College or a professional organization, a professional veterinary organization that you've contributed significantly to. Uh, in some capacity, you've moved your subject forward. There are many, many areas, of course, that you cannot be a specialist in or there are no specialist qualifications available for that subject. And so we recognize that uh, and we look to see if you are uh, a leader in your area and that area could be anything. It doesn't, it could be uh, charity work. It could be uh, uh, aspects 
of uh, industry. It could be practice management. And we have to think broadly, how is it you've, you've advanced your subject? Leadership, uh, as you might imagine, is fairly, fairly clear. And then the last one, there is always a role for dissemination of information uh, to the public, uh, whether that's through media, through writing, uh, through, through good deeds, through charity work, uh, some way improving the, the role of the profession within, within the, the community. Uh, and that is always going to be encouraged. We'll start with a specific uh, knowledge-based route. Uh, this, as you might imagine, is uh, biased towards people in active research. Uh, this, the successful candidates in the past have had a long history of academic or, or innovative research uh, in industry, uh, uh, laptop-based work, uh, clinical-based work, uh, it, very often uh, this is the closest I guess to along the lines of a thesis so many applicants or most applicants in this pathway will have performed some form of doctoral level achievement. Uh, the, we're looking for a, a personal statement at the beginning to describe what your contribution has been and importantly the impact of that contribution. Uh, we are aware that some fields are less uh, read, are more minority areas than others. And so we are looking to try and understand how you have impacted your, your field. For example, if you are writing a paper a week but no one's reading them, that is less attractive than writing a paper a year or a paper every two years that everyone reads. And that's important to be aware that the the number of things you publish is not key here, it's actually the impact on your area. As you can see below, uh, below that realistically, given the fact we're looking at PhD work, given the fact we're looking at their publication profile, given that we're looking at how has that impacted the area, that takes time to develop. Um, and so broadly speaking, this is not a guide, so this is not a rule, this is just a guide. Many applicants will have been working in that field for around about 15 years after qualification. If, however, your, your, uh, your packet uh, is sufficiently strong before that, then we would absolutely encourage it to be submitted. So that's just a simple guide. And as you can see in that packet, we look at your publications, um, and on the back of that, we'll be looking at how actively they are uh, referenced by your peers, uh, the citation index, to get an understanding of exactly what I said before, uh, is what you're publishing being adopted by your peers. Some form of a doctoral level achievement, uh, and then dissemination of that ideally uh, through uh, mentoring in, in the lab, uh, postdoctoral work, um, or extending that out uh, from into the wider community uh, and of course any other granting funds you've been awarded uh, is important. If you submit an application for knowledge and you've never in your entire career received a single pound of granting money it may be that, that isn't the most appropriate path for you because the question will be well ha is the work you're doing is it well funded um, is it attracting support that often goes hand in hand with perceived importance and relevance. I'm not again saying that's exclusively not the case but it would be surprising if someone in this path hadn't had never received a single grant in their career. Uh, and finally uh, uh, your contribution to the profession uh, in different ways. So clinical practice um, this path we have uh, discovered over the past two years is more uh, popular, I guess, um, for active specialists uh, who are working full-time in clinical practice. I would not say that you need to be a specialist to, be, to apply to be a fellow, and there are many, many fellows who are not specialists, and that's important to um, point out. The 
for the clinical practice path, uh, we'd need uh, likewise a 2,000 word summary to explain your achievements uh, uh, from, from uh, post-graduation. And again, how that's advanced uh, profession, uh, typically through clinical scholarship uh, and learning leadership. Uh, as you can see below, we're then looking at bodies of work that you've created. Um, and again, to demonstrate one of the, bit, one of the below. Uh, so something that you've worked on that is being adopted by your peers, uh, that has actually improved your discipline significantly and has warranted publication. Uh, the, an area of professional practice that you excel at and are considered a, a leader on by your peers. Um, and uh, again, ideally, uh, an attempt to share that uh, knowledge and mentor others. Because that is always a key part of what we're doing here is how is what you've done in your career so far advanced uh, the people around you? Because that ultimately, like I said before, is a cornerstone of the fellowship. It's, it's a learner society which is looking to advance the profession in multiple ways. And that means what, with what you've been doing up to now, how have you pushed things forward and pushed people forward around you uh, uh, through contribution? Uh, continue, continuing on with clinical practice, you can see we're moving into, um, uh, again, uh, clinical-based projects, uh, clinical-based ideas and techniques, uh, and then finally any postgraduate qualifications. And the last two is very often uh, about complex issues and specialist fields, so being at the forefront of your field clinically. Um, and the final sentence on that page is again to stress that many RCVS specialists uh, will apply to the fellowship, but those are mutually, uh, they're not mutually inclusive. And many specialists uh, choose to apply uh, to the clinical practice route. And finally, the profession, which is uh, the, the most diverse, uh, often most fascinating path, because this can be drawn from any aspect of veterinary medicine. Uh, and uh, what we're looking here is some form of sustained contribution that has had a, a, a positive and, and significant impact on the profession in some or any capacity. We're looking for a role of, of leadership uh, within that field to, and that could be, as we say, could be education, could be politics, some form of national or international contribution to veterinary medicine. Uh, that's key. Uh, but that does not have to be, uh, as I said, within a particular specialty, does not need to be clinically based. Uh, it can be any contribution to the profession in some capacity. A body of evidence to support the application uh, may well not be papers, it may well not be publications. It could be uh, legislation change, it could be organizing meetings. It could be uh, successful support of individuals around you to, to greater things. And so we need to understand how that has benefited uh, the discipline you're working in, uh, from, from, uh, whether that's in the forces, in practice, in academics, where, where, wherever you happen to be. We are looking for references, of course, for all paths. Um, and we realize that some of these references may not even be VETS. We are looking to have at least uh, three references, ideally three, and we recognize that not all three will be MRCVS or FRCVS because there are many people who work in your field who are not veterinary surgeons who have a very key understanding um, on uh, what that actually means uh, to uh, how you have changed things around you. Uh, and that's the end of the profession. Now I'll hand you over to Myra who will then go through some of her experiences and how that links in with what we've been discussing. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, yes, I, I decided to apply last year in 2016 for the fellowship. Um, and initially I was thinking, well, am I good enough or can I apply? Do, do I fit this um, fellowship? Um, and I looked at it and I thought, well, I've, I've been in practice for a very, very long time and I've contributed I think quite a bit and I've also um, gained quite a bit of experience which I felt was you know 
if I were part of a learned body, I would be able to give something back. Um, and there was also obviously the personal pride of becoming a fellow that played a role as well. So it was kind of a, a bit dual, this application of actually personal pride and at the same time being able to give something back to the profession using my experience over, over my working life. Um, I was initially a little bit uncertain. You know, Nick has explained the three routes uh, of application as to what application I should be applying for. Um, I've been a clinician at heart uh, throughout my professional life. So clinical practice was the obvious one. But then I also thought, well, um, you know, the, the, the guide to, to the profession, the professional kind of route might also be applicable because I've done other things as well that, that hopefully have um, helped the profession. And, and um, you know, so I wasn't entirely sure. But in the end, I opted for the clinical practice route. Um, and the, the application itself was fairly straightforward um, and you just had to fill in, you know, go to the loops and, and fill in the boxes and, you know, basically state your case as to why you think you should be a fellow. Um, in choosing the references, I, I kind of went a fairly obvious route. Uh, I went to people that have known me throughout my working life, um, know, know me well, um, and, and it was therefore not that difficult and, and you know, luckily they all agreed to be uh, my referee. So what I used in my application was uh, the clinical practice side because I'm a specialist. So I feel I've contributed quite significantly to clinical practice. And I've also uh, co-founded North Downs, which is uh, one of the leading referral practices within the country and one of the earlier ones as well, into quite a large referral practice that actually you know, employs a lot of specialists and, and you know, provides CPD, gives back to the referring vets and hopefully um, gives, gives a good service. Um, I've also throughout my life um, have been quite involved in CPD through North Downs, um, but also through, um, you know, through you know, the BSAVA and other um, organizations uh, giving CPD. Um, I've published because obviously as a specialist, um, I have had to do my publications, but I'm not a research person. So I knew that the applications through the knowledge route was not for me. But I've done enough publications so that I can actually help with reviewing uh, papers. Um, I've been on the board for the Journal of um, Feline Medicine, for instance, on the editorial board for quite a few years um, and, and did reviews there. And I've been heavily involved in the Royal College, um, both on the medicine board and examining the diplomas. Um, and now also obviously with the advanced practitioner side of things and now the fellowship as well. Um, so again, it's about giving something back. And I have been involved in the European Society of Feline Medicine, which is now the International Society of Feline Medicine, um, on their board for, for several years as board member and treasurer and then uh, president as well. So again, advancing feline practice um, in the world, hopefully. So I felt that I had enough experience and enough broad experience that I thought, well, I, I can apply. They might still you know, turn me down, but I, I felt I, I had something to give. And that's why I applied. Have the next slide, please. Um, so we'll look at the applicants a little bit uh, further on, but um, I, I was also, like Nick, um, I think it's important to stress that you don't have to be a specialist, you don't have to be a researcher to apply and also to become a fellow. So what we did is actually looked at um, past applicants from last year who have been successful, who are not necessarily academics nor specialists. Um, just to give you a bit of a flavour of, you know, who, who applies and who's been successful. Um, so I'll go through those four examples that I picked out. I mean, there were a few more, but those were quite, I thought, I thought were really interesting CVs, really. Um, one of the applicants was very heavily involved in Ebola to the extent that actually they went to Africa and helped set up um, the medics <laughs> in terms of getting, getting the camp working for uh, Ebola and the quarantine and everything else. So there was definitely some, giving a lot back to the profession there. Um, he'd also been a, a trustee and was, is still a trustee of the charity and has been heavily involved in the Royal College. But he's not a specialist. He hasn't got a, a, a major kind of research body um, of, of publications. So it, it really is a different route. Um, one applicant, um, not, a, not a kind of specialist again, um, has been working his whole life in India on um, 
basically uh, population control of, of the street dogs and also rabies control, which actually has reduced uh, the level of rabies in that country markedly, reduced the dog population markedly, and at the same time, through this population control, reduced the number of dog bites um, from to humans uh, very significantly and with that work he's actually he's published some of that work because he's, he's actually made a, a huge difference uh, by his work and also he's spoken about this work as well so he was a, again a, an excellent example of a, of a fellow that actually will be able to contribute significantly to this learned body. Another ap um, applicant was um, basically had a promotion of lifelong learning um, and had been involved in, in kind of setting up learning projects throughout and advancing the kind of continues the CPD that's now kind of almost embedded in our profession, but it didn't used to be as embedded as it is now. And she'd been really um, you know, instrumental in setting that up and also heavily involved recently in the a Healthy Mind Project, which again is a, a massive contribution to the profession. The fact that people are now speaking about it and learning more about it um, is great. Um, the last example I've got here is, is the promotion of goat health and knowledge and it's one of these examples where there is not a specialization specifically for goats but this person has significantly contributed through his work and then disseminating the knowledge of goat medicine um, to, to the profession and um, again was an excellent candidate for this fellowship. So this is just a, a few examples of where people might feel actually I don't have to be a specialist. I don't have to have a PhD to apply for this. So these are some of the different routes where people have made a massive difference. They can contribute a lot to the profession through different routes. So next slide, please. So just a review of what happened in 2016 in terms of the applicants. So in total, there were 56 applications. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that most of them were go coming through knowledge, um, which is MCK, and then second was through clinical practice. Um, if you look at these applications, most of them do come through academia um, and specialist status, but there are some other ones, as I already stated in my last um, during my last slide. And it's also interesting to note something that Nick already alluded to: the fact that some people were moved from one to the other um, application because that the panel felt that actually they were better, better kind of suited for uh, another application. So one, um, you know, five were approved through the, for instance, if you look under the, clinic, um, the knowledge one, um, five of those were moved to clinical practice on, on second review where it was felt that, that that was a better space for them. I don't know whether you want to add anything to this, uh, Nick, as you were more involved than I in, in this. Yeah, so this was, uh, like we mentioned briefly earlier, this was um, uh, the first cohort, really. And as uh, you might expect, possibly uh, a large bias towards ac uh, academics and specialist practice. And that is not the prime goal um, you might argue that, that, that these people are better at filling out um, these sorts of um, applications they have easier access to some of the resources um, the but I think what we tried to and that, that's why there's a very heavy bias towards knowledge I feel what we try have been trying to do is uh, explain and be as transparent as possible uh, what happened this year. The, the success rate this year was around, for, for 2016 was around about 80% uh, of the applicants were successful. And I, I'd prefer to say that way because the key thing about the fellowship uh, is deliberately there is no number of, of restrictions on applications. We want, some people may apply fractionally too early. Some people may need to work on uh, selling a particular aspect of their career differently uh, and in a year or maybe two years then then it's a significant a very very different situation um, the fellowship of course is it, it's for life there is no re-review there is no um, uh, re-submission to keep your status like there is for some specialties uh, and there's the target uh, is to try and uh, uh, I guess 
continue that contribution. But we're trying not to, for people to be discouraged but if they're not successful in the first attempt. Because it's very much like a driving test for some people. It just takes a bit more experience, a bit more um, awareness. And uh, certainly going from 2016 to 2017, uh, there were people who were not successful last year who were successful on the second attempt uh, through mentoring and guidance. So if we go to the next one, so there you go, Mike. Um, so we had the fellowship day last October, um, and, and I have to say it was it was I, it was a good experience. It was really well organised. It was at the Royal Institute, which was a, a great place to be. Um, it's it's the place where science was born, really, to be honest. So I I, I felt really honoured to be there, and the day was very well organised. Um, there were forty four successful candidates, and um, a lot of the old fellows were there as well, if I may say so. And um, the new fellows with um, some of their family members were there. And it, it made for a terrific day of actually uh, meeting everybody, but also listening to some great talks. Can I have the next slide, please? So as well as, as um, having a talk from the RCVS president and then kind of uh, being given the, the fellowship um, certificate. Um, there was a keynote speaker from the human field who was quite entertaining. Um, and then there was also um, a time for social interaction um, where you could actually meet and greet all fellows. And, and it was really a, a great meeting of minds. And we had a, a great day at the Royal Institute. And at the end, if for people who actually are attending uh, this, this next the 2017 Royal, uh, Fellowship Day, um, it's actually great to go in the basement and actually look at the museum as well. So take your time to do that because, again, um, it is where science is born. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, place to go to. So can I have the next one, please? So we're now in 2017. And again, the number of applications has been great. Um, so we haven't seen a dip, which is, which is good. And we now can see that there are a little bit, a few more applications from uh, clinical practice uh, compared to, to, to knowledge. But again, quite a high approval rate. Um, and again, great candidates and great um, new fellows that are joining this, this body of, of a learned society. Yeah, so it was encouraging as you can see a massive decrease in applications for knowledge and increase uh well over doubling for the profession uh one one practitioner for first year and five in year two and then we had a, a some uh people were moved from clinical practice into the profession uh this year um the uh also um um, the, the, a high um, uh, rate of approval in terms of the applications this year actually slightly higher than the year before. The year before was 79%, this year was higher than that. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, that has set up a, a more successful, even more successful, I hope, fellowship day this year. As we way back... Um, at the beginning, we had 2013, we had 236 fellows uh, at the outset. So by 2016, that was probably only about 240. What we've realized, or what you can do the maths yourselves, but we've added almost 100 or so in two years, which is approximately 50% growth in two years. This is I, I, what I hope will generate some momentum, uh, some uh, a different shift of energies uh, into the fellowship. Uh, that's quite a large change for a relatively small fellowship previously. And so we are openly embracing applications, but even with where we've been so far, the fellowship has increased by 50% almost in a couple of years. And so uh, whether we add 50 a year for the next 20 years, who knows? Importantly, we are going to be looking, as I said, on, on merits, not numbers. Um, and so we would encourage applications uh, because uh, we've, what we've learned in a very, very short space of time is the phenomenally diverse and quite frankly incredibly impressive contributions that actually we were unaware of collectively and as individuals. I think that's been one of the most enlightening, enlightening things. There's now a forum and, and, uh, for these uh, areas to be celebrated. Good. So we're now going to the Fellowship Day 2017, which will be on the 20th of October this year. 
So the aim of this event is, first of all, to give the new fellows their new, their new fellowship um, certificate and to congratulate them on that achievement, but also to, um, in a way, make them welcome in, in the kind of learned body. Um, and what we also want to encourage, really, is for fellows to start talking more and start, you know, start talking more cross-discipline as well, um, and actually to really emphasise the fact that this fellowship is not just about getting the fellowship but it's also as nick already has said about giving back to the profession so as things progress the hope is really that the new fellows and the old fellows really will become more involved in this and actually start mentoring uh giving back their knowledge and and provide almost like a knowledge base for people to go to that they have if they have a problem in a certain a certain area they can actually go to the fellows and say look i have this problem is there somebody within your body that can actually help us with this. Um, Anthony said that I had organized the day. I thought that was a bit flattering. We, we, we did it within a team. So it was uh, Nick and then Dick Sibley is a new um, fellow as well. And then obviously Duncan Ash, especially from the Royal College. Um, we organized the, the program for the day. And, and it's a terrific program, actually. I would encourage um, you know, everybody to attend um, as, as long as there are seats available. Um, so obviously the program will be the presentation of the new fellows. Um, which will take some time, obviously, but it gives you an opportunity to see who's actually been successful this year. And then as a keynote speaker, we've got Alice Roberts, Professor Alice Roberts from Birmingham, who actually is um, quite well known from television and um, everything in, in terms of her knowledge about um, different aspects. And, and she's going to talk about uh, the species that we tamed uh, in, as humans and that have been uh, instrumental in our development as humans as well. So it's going to be very fascinating and interesting talk. She's a very kind of enigmatic speaker. Uh, the other thing that we thought in terms of disseminating knowledge would be very interesting is to do some TED style talks by fellows. Because I do think that um, you know, by having a couple of fellows talking about their specific level of expertise, it, it, it could be very interesting. I'm very interested in, in, in hearing about bits of, of the profession that I have got no knowledge about. So there will be some TED style talk, um, talks about rabies, about coral health, um, badgers and, and tuberculosis, um, some about the medical and veterinary relationship, which I think is really interesting. Um, the specialty of the GP, which again, we, we think is, is quite an important topic. Um, somebody's going to speak on cataract and there's going to be um, a speak on kind of what is happening with corporate practice. So these are all very interesting short talks where somebody just kind of, you know, talks to the other fellows about things that they are passionate about. So again, I think this is a really good addition to the fellowship day. There will be some poster sessions, uh, again, people just uh, writing down what they think is, is interesting. Um, and, um, you know, then from then on, there will be some social aspect to it as well, where fellows, again, can talk to each other um, and just um, enjoy uh, being together. So it, it will be a really, really interesting day. Um, Obviously, I don't know quite how many people will apply to, to come to this day, but there may be some spare seats. So if you are interested in becoming a fellow, but are not a fellow yet, but are interested in things, um, then uh, Duncan Ash at the Royal College has uh, suggested that you contact him. And um, if there are some spare tickets going, then he'll be happy to, to give those. Because again, it will be a great day for people to attend. Sorry, is that what happened there? Yes. Uh, it just suddenly... Can you see something? I can see the see it now again. I can oh, see. I apologise. It just went black as, as I was watching it. Yes, it did. I think the next slide is yours again, Nick. Okay. Sorry about that, Nick and uh, Myra, but it's back again. So I think we're all okay. So yeah, just carry on. So yeah. just the last couple of minutes. Uh, where we're we going? So in addition to promoting conversation and dialogue between fellows, uh, the Royal College has a science advisory panel has asked the fellowship to uh, adopt that role, which I think potentially is fantastic. Uh, they have recently reviewed subjects, for example, homeopathy, renal transplants, corneal tr implants in, in small animals. In response to questions to the Royal College or from the uh, general public, and the fellowship potentially has a, 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 an excellent 
knowledge base, uh, whether that's uh, epidemiology, whether it's physiology, whether it's practice, whether it's uh, any aspect uh, of each of those, uh, to try and bring together uh, a well-informed uh, opinion based on what, what factor is out there. So that's something that I hope we can actually will be announcing in Fellowship Day this year. And finally, uh, we've been discussing with Myra and also the, the Veterinary Schools Council. We've had some dialogue with them about bringing the fellowship awareness uh, up in the schools themselves. Uh, and that's something, again, I hope to share some ideas with the Fellowship Day uh, this year. Because uh, our goal is to bring the potential for fellowship into students' minds at even a small acorn level. Because currently, I think it's fair to say when most of us leave vet school, fellowship doesn't really mean very much. Uh, and our goal is to plant those acorns uh, as students and then try and work with them going forward. So that's the uh, website for the fellowship. On there, you will see uh, a few case stories of applicants, why they applied, what they do, what they hope to get out of it, uh, all the paperwork for application, uh, and any, any in, uh, questions you may have can be directed through that regarding suitability for application, regarding any guidance about mentorship, uh, uh, any specific logistical questions about application, or if you just want to talk to someone about what you're doing and is it, is it a good idea or uh, there's every chance you're in a better place than you think. And if you email the, the contact number on the, uh, there, we, we should be able to arrange someone to get back to you. Uh, there is no application fee, importantly, and there is no limit on applications. So if you are successful, there is a, a, an annual fee. Uh, although you can apply any number of times, we will, of course, every single year, if you are unsuccessful, give you as much feedback as possible about why perhaps you weren't successful on that particular occasion. So uh, all, I would, all I would advise is that that feedback is being given for a reason, uh, again, with an attempt to improve your overall chances. So uh, we would hope you take that information on board. So thank you. In summary, it's a new initiative launched 18 months ago. Uh, we are looking to create, uh, I hope, a fellowship to be proud of uh, in veterinary medicine, uh, something that hopefully will be looked at with some degree of, of envy from across the world to be able to bring all of these key contributors together in all aspects of the profession, uh, all aspects of uh, career choice and path uh, to come together to improve our understanding. Thank you very much. That was excellent. We, we have had a question. Are you okay to, to answer Absolutely. that? Yeah. So uh, Adil has said, is there any specific age? Um, you know, because it sounds like you both are leading uh, the practice in your field. So do you have to be a certain age before you? There is no specific age. Um, uh, for knowledge, the guide was 15 years after graduation, just with an expectation of what you might need to achieve in terms of research in your field. For the other parts, no, there is not a specific age at all. Realistically, it's going to take, for most people, at least five years to make a difference in some areas. That yeah. doesn't mean that that is a, because uh, some people within five years can, can change the world, but uh, we're not looking for that necessarily. But realistically, five years or longer, is a guide that's great thank you nick um oh another question has just popped up um all oh, right this person is saying she, they don't have a license uh to practice in the uk so presumably you have to be a royal college member to actually yeah, apply for fellowship to apply um you need to be a member of the royal college yeah but you do not need to be practicing in the UK. Okay. So that's your membership is valid and active, yes. you can apply. That's great. Um, 
thank you so much. It was really interesting also to hear your story, Myra, and how, how it all kind of came to fruition and congratulations on, on your success. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a very interesting initiative and it's good to see that there are people who are putting themselves forward uh, for it. So thanks once again. Obviously, all recorded. So uh, if, if you're watching this in a few months, you probably have missed the uh, Royal College Fellowship Day. But of course, it's got loads of info, good information on this webinar as to how to look, um, you know, to apply for next year. Presumably the application, I think you did say, is open kind of all year round, although obviously people have now missed for this year, so they would they would have their opportunity in October of next year. Uh, correct. So it's an open application uh, year long, but the, uh, the deadline, if you like, to be considered for Fellowship Day 2018 will be, I think it's actually on the website, but it's early February of 2018. So actually, if you're wanting to apply, we're now sort of September. Time's yeah, can move well, quickly. Well, you've got several months before that closes for consideration for next year. Yeah. Yeah, but forms take a little bit of time to do, so it's worth having a look at and, of yeah. course, pulling all your information together. Yeah, great. Great. Yeah. Nick, thank you so much, Nick. Thank you very much, Myra. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing you soon, and I hope you've all enjoyed the webinar, those of you who are on. Mm -hmm.